Lesson 5.5, .5, graphs of relations and function. In this lesson, what we're going to look at is two very important things. The first thing we're going to learn is how to determine if something is a function or not. And then we're also going to talk about uh, domain and range. All right? uh, domain and range are going to play out uh, a lot in the years to come, so it's important that we have a good uh, foundation today. So let's get started here. The relation y equals 2x is graphed, as we have on the right-hand side here. We know that the relation y equals 2x is a function. All right, and we know that because each value of x associates with exactly one value of y. And each ordered pair has a different first element. So if we ever saw something like this, like let's say you put in 2 and you got 4, and then you also put in 3 and you got 4, that would not meet this condition that we've just uh, dealt with right here, and we'd say that this would not be a function if that ever uh, occurred. All right? And specifically what we're going to also look at in this unit is uh, talking about uh, the domain. All right? I'm trying to figure out what this domain word means. The domain of a function is a set of values of the independent variable or the set of x values. And so you're normally going to think of it in terms of the x values. All right, and then uh, conversely we have the range. The range of a function is the set of dependent variable, sorry, is the set of values of the, we also have the range. The range of a function is the set of values of the dependent variable or the set of y values. So if you ever see me asking you guys what the domain is, I'm basically asking you for the function that you have, what possible x values make sense. When I ask you for the range, I'm asking what possible y values make sense. All right? And how we're going to do this is we're going to use something called the vertical line test. A vertical line test says that um, a graph represents a function when two points on the graph do not lie on the same vertical line. All right? So we're going to use this thing called the vertical line test. And so I'll show you down here how it's very, very easy to determine if something is a function or not. All right? So here are two different functions we have here. We have one that is um, shoe size versus height. And we have one that is uh, the world population um, by year. Okay? So let's figure out if they are or are not a function. So the first one here, we're going to use the vertical line test. If you basically can ever take a vertical line and it hits more than one point. So for instance, notice right here, if I take a vertical line, it goes through these points like so, and another vertical line goes through those points. If that ever occurs, we can say it is not a function. And the reason behind this would be it failed vertical line test. So if you ever put a vertical line through a graph and it hits at more than one point, then that means that you have a non-function. Over here, no matter where I take a vertical line, through that point, through that point, through all these points like so, it only hits one point on this graph, so we would say that this is a function. Right? Fairly straightforward, that's known as the vertical line test, very, very important. Right on the back page here, example two. Use the graph of the function f of x equals negative 3x plus 7, and they want you to determine some things about this graph. First thing it says is to determine the range value when the domain value is negative 3. So when they say the domain value is negative 3, they're really actually just trying to say x equals negative 3. So they want you to put uh, negative 3 into this equation to determine what y is, or we could just simply look at this graph over here. So if you take negative 3 in the x, it would be right here, and we'd look at what the corresponding y value would be, we'd see we'd have this point right up there. And so we can say that the range value would be y is equal to 16. Okay. Um, the next one asks, determine what f of 1 is. Well, I'm showing you a bunch of different ways they can kind of ask the same question. When they ask you to determine f of 1, they're really saying what is? They're saying x equals 1, and they want you to find out what y equals. Okay. So f of 1, notice how it's f of x. Whenever they ask f of 1, think of that, that they've already substituted the 1 in for the x, and we're trying to figure out what y is. So this time we'd look. What happens when x is 1? So 1 would be right here, and we'd go up to 4. So we would say that y equals 4, like so. So you could write this and say that f of 1 is actually equal to 4. Okay. 
The next one we have here is C. Determine the value of x, so this time we're trying to find x, when f of x equals 1. That really means this function here is 1. Another way to think of f of x is just to think of it as y. So they're really saying y equals 1. Okay, now you have a height of 1 because these are going up by 2, so this is actually at 2 here. You have a height of 1 right in the middle right there, and therefore it is equal to 2. So we would say that x is equal to 2. Now the neat thing is if, let's say I didn't give you a graph for this question, you could have done this using algebra. So I would have just taken my original equation, I'll just do this over here on the side, f of x is equal to negative 3x plus 7. And imagine if I went and I substitute in 1 here, and have 1 is equal to negative 3x plus 7. I would subtract 7 from both sides, get negative 6. And dividing by negative 3, we would have found out that x is equal to 2. Okay, so either way you do that makes no difference to me. You need to know how to do them both. Um, next thing says, circle the coordinate that is represented by f of negative 1 and 10. Well, this is actually the ordered pair, right? 10 is your x. All right, D says, circle the coordinate that is represented by f of negative 1 equals 10. So remember how it's always f of x. That tells you that your negative 1 is your x. And so when they put in negative 1 into the function, it gave them 10. All right, so where would this uh, negative 1, 10 be up here on the graph? Well, if we go over 1 in the negative direction and up 10, we would have this point right here. All right, example 3 is very similar to the last example that we did. As a result, I would like you to uh, try pausing the video here, go through these on your own, and then uh, fast forward and see if your answers are the same as mine. So the first one says, determine the domain value, so that means they're looking for what x is when the range value is 5. So I see a range value of 5 right here, okay, because they're going up by 2 again. And so therefore, my solution for this one would be x equals 2. This next one said, determine f of 0. That's the same thing as writing x equals 0. So that means when x is equal to 0, it looks like I have this point right here. That would be at negative 3. So I could say f of 0 equals negative 3. Next one says, determine the value of x when f of x equals negative 7. That's the same thing as saying y equals negative 7, so they're looking for x. So when y is equal to negative 7, that would be approximately right here. We would say x is equal to negative 1. The last one said, circle the coordinate that is represented by f of 3 equals 9. Well, that's, of course, the ordered pair 3, 9. And we would say that this ordered pair would be over 3. 9, like so. All right, the last page here, we're going to take a look a little bit uh, closer at domain and range of a graph. What we're going to see in the years to come is that domain and range is going to be very important, so I want you guys to get comfortable just looking at a graph and trying to determine what the domain and range is. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples right here. The examples might be a little over the top, um, but and anyways, these examples are going to be different ways that you can determine what the domain and range is. So we're first going to talk about the domain. This graph, of course, is the same on both sides. The domain on the uh, left-hand side is your x, and then the range over here is your y. So I'm looking here what possible x values you can have. Well, one way that we can do this is we can think about um, shining a, uh, a flashlight. If you imagine we had like a gigantic flashlight up here, like so. We're flashing it down on the graph from the top and also from the bottom, like so. We can look and see where the shadow would hit. Where would there ever be a shadow on the x-axis? So let's go from the top down. So from the top down, you see on this part of the graph right here, there would be a shadow on the x-axis right there, okay? Because the light would hit it, and then it wouldn't go through. Okay. And then the other part where that would exist would be right from here on. So let's say on the x-axis would be right there. Okay. Now from the bottom flashlight, you would have a shadow on this portion right here, and you'd have a shadow on that portion right there. So what we could say is we could say that um, the domain would be everything from wherever this point is right here to that point right there. Okay. So w filling out the notes here, the domain is represented by the shadow on the x axis. And you could also imagine squishing the function towards the axes. Imagine if I just squished that function towards the axes, it would just make a straight line just like we had. Well, the range is kind of the same way over here except I'm going to have the flashlights coming in from the side. So that one on the left and this one on the right. And we would look at where does it make this time a shadow on the y-axis, okay? because we're looking for the y uh, values. So 
This one on the right hand side you'll see will actually make a shadow everywhere from this point all the way down to right here like so. And the one on the other side would make a shadow just from here to here. But because you have a shadow all the way from there to there, you'd say that those points would be represented by your domain. Sorry, by your range. So since we have a shadow all the way from the top to the bottom, we would say that all of those points would be members of the range. All right, so let's look at uh, some examples of doing this. Number four here, determine the domain and range of the graphs of each function. So you may want to use that um, way I was dealing with before with the flashlights, or you may just be able to uh, do it a little bit easier here. So see what you think. All right, example four, determine the domain and range of the graphs of each function. Now I've given you that strategy with the flashlight. I found some students like it, some students don't. Some students like just thinking what would happen if you just squished it amongst the axes. Um, see what you think. Let's give this a try. So the domain. Let's deal with the domain for this one. And we'll deal with the range for this one. So domain, let's start there. Domain is saying what possible x values can you have. Well, this graph, you see that we have an x value right here at, looks like, 3. And then it goes infinitely in this direction. Because this graph, since it goes off the page, we would assume that it's going to keep going the way it is. Well, this graph is actually continually going towards the left or in the negative direction. So we'd express the domain saying that we have a value at 3 and everything less than 3. So using an inequality, we say x is less than or equal to 3. Now let's talk about the range. I'll erase this stuff here. The range is saying what possible y values can you have. Well, so now I'm looking on the y-axis. Notice that I have a value here at negative 1. And then the graph goes infinitely high because this is going up, 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 up. So you would say the range for this is y must be greater than or equal to this point we have right here at negative 1, everything above that. All right. Let's look at b here. We have another kind of unique looking function. Let's talk about the domain and the range. The domain, what possible x values do you have? We have values that go from negative 2 all the way to positive 2. So in mathematics, how we're going to say between, you can have anything between here as we use this notation. We say x must be less than or equal to the biggest number here is 2 and the smallest number here, which is negative 2. All right. So if you want to make this little note, this represents between. We can have anything between 2 and negative 2. In terms of the range, the highest value I have here is at 2, and the lowest value I have here is at 0. So we'd say that y must be less than or equal to the big value 2, and greater than or equal to the small value 0. Okay, That means between 2 and 0. Right on the back page, interval notation. Uh, interval notation is just a different way that we can express the domain and range, so we're going to take a look at this uh, a little bit more closely. It says a notation for representing an interval as a pair of numbers. The numbers are the endpoints of the interval. Parentheses, so parentheses when I say that I'm meaning these kind of square guys, or brackets like so, are used to show whether the endpoints are excluded or included. So for example, I have parentheses 3, 8 bracket, is the interval of real numbers between 3 and 8, so this implies between 3 and 8, including 3 and excluding 8. So this type of a square means include. This means exclude. So what we would think here is that we actually start with 3 and then we get infinitely close to 8, but we don't include it. How you put this on a number line is you would have a, a dot at 3, and let's say a dot at 8, all right? We would say that we want to include 3. So we used a filled in dot to mean include. And this is going to go all the way to 8. We're going to get infinitely close to 8, but we're not going to include it. All right. All right, example 5 here. Determine the domain and range of the following relations using words, inequalities, and interval notation. So when we get towards the provincial exam, you're going to see that they could ask you this anyway. All right. So let's say we have the ordered pair here at negative 5 and 4. So, and I'm going to leave the dot open, and I'm going to say that this dot goes, this graph goes infinitely in this direction. Okay. Let's try and figure out what the domain and range of this thing is. So, first thing they want you to do is talk about the domain um, in terms of words. So we'll do domain up here in terms of words. So what possible x values can you have? Well, you can have anything, it looks like, that's greater than, remember this ordered pair is at negative 5, 4. You can have anything that's from negative 5 onward. So I would say 
any real numbers